Welcome to Jungit's Games. Today I'll be discussing my top 11 older games, and those are defined as games that were published first in 2010 or earlier. Now, this topic was suggested by one of the contributing producer level supporters of this channel, and then it won the vote for this month. Now, you can learn more about how all that works if you go to patreon.com slash Games, and if you'd like to directly support the creation of videos just like this one, then I do hope you would consider doing that. Uh, now, I did say this is going to be a top 11 list, because when I made the list, I found I just didn't want to not talk about the 11th game, so I'm going to talk about these 11 instead of the top 10 that was originally requested. Uh, I am going to put a full list of them down in the description with timestamps, so that is a bit of a spoiler list if you want to take a look at it, or you can just proceed to this video and see what I say. Uh, now, I am going to be talking about them in reverse order, so I'll be starting with number 11, and let's go ahead and start now. So, number 11 is Can't Stop, and uh, this is one of the older games that I have in my collection. Uh, technically, uh, Board Game Geek says this was first published in 1980, although for some reason I thought it was published even earlier than that in the 70s. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this one and make it a top 11 list is because uh, this game is very nostalgic for me. Uh, the copy of Can't Stop that I have is one that I played as a six or seven year old. <laughs> this is a game that I actually uh, took from my parents' board game collection a few years ago because they don't really play with them anymore uh, because this is just an excellent game. Like it was super fun when I was seven years old and it's still super fun now that I am 37 years old. And um, I like the fact that my box is super old and like it's super faded. Like at one point it must've been sitting out for years with, you know, underneath something. So it's got a weird line on it. But either way, let's talk about the game itself. Now, this is a Sid Saxon design game. And uh, it is a push your luck dice game. It's really simple. Every single turn, you're going to roll four dice and then you pair them up into two pairs in any way you want. You sum the pips up and then you move these little indicators up tracks. Uh, now you only can move three indicators. And if at any point you are in a situation where you can't move any of your indicators, then you bust and you lose all of the progress that you had. So that means as you're playing, you have this feeling where you just can't stop. Like you've already done so much. And you know, one of the indicators is on a seven, for instance. And you're like, well, seven is the most commonly uh, summed up pip value from two dice. So I should be fine. I'm going to keep going. But then you roll just, you know, a crazy roll with like, you know, a couple of uh, ones and a couple of twos. And you realize that you bust and you lose everything. And that moment is wonderful. <laughs> it's, it's not good when you lose, obviously. But the moment of thinking, do I stop or not? Like this is just a, a perfect distillation of the game name. You feel like you can't stop. And it has this great group dynamic too, where it's fully competitive, but your opponents feel vested in egging you on to roll just one more time because they actually want you to bust. So it's a game that I've had an incredible amount of fun with. Um, I've played this copy, obviously, for about 30 years or so off and on. Uh, there's also a great adaptation of it on uh, iOS that I've played with uh, various people um, at one point with a bunch of coworkers when we were on break at work a few years ago. We were uh, I taught it to them in a Starbucks and we sat there and uh, I think we pissed everybody off because we were laughing so much as we're playing Can't Stop on an iPad in the middle of a Starbucks in a rainstorm. Uh, so um, this is just a really fun game. It's super nostalgic for me, and I think it still uh, holds up the test of time, and it's it's quite old. <laughs> Definitely not a recent publication, and I did want to talk about it here. Uh, so now we can move on to game number 10, and that one is Finca. Now, this one is actually one of the newest on the list. This was published in 2009, and that happens to coincide just about with when I really fell into the uh, board gaming uh, hobby, or at least modern board gaming. Uh, Finca is a a wonderful little Euro game where you have a windmill in the middle of the board that's uh, randomly made every single game. And it has different, uh, I guess, sail or fins on the windmills that have different colors. And you have a bunch of your farmers on the windmills. So that thematically doesn't make a lot of sense. But what you do on your turn is you are going to move one of your farmers forward. And the number of spaces forward that you go is uh, dictated by the number of farmers that were on the spot where you started. So if there were three farmers there, then I move three spaces. If there are five farmers there, I have to move five spaces. Then where you land, you're going to get a number of the associated fruit with the color of the uh, fin, and you will get a number of fruit equal to the number of farmers that are now on that space. So if I, there were three where I uh, jumped off and I moved three spaces and I land on a spot where there's just one other, now there's two farmers and I get two lemons or something like that. Now that is the core idea of this game. And the rest of the game kind of rides on top of that. You're doing uh, essentially set collection, trying to get various tokens by cashing in these different pieces of fruit. And there's a couple other things going on. But the main piece of this game is that wonderfully elegant idea. The, the windmill is different every single time you play. You just shuffle it up as part of setup. And I, I just... 
I think it's such a cool mechanic for uh, interacting with your opponents. You have to really think about what you want to plan to do. Like maybe you'll move a farmer here to get a fruit you don't super care about to, to set yourself up really great for the next turn to jump onto this other spot and get the thing that you really need. So it's a bit of a puzzle trying to set yourself up, but also your opponents can definitely mess with that. They could land a farmer where you are, get a bunch of fruit, and then you're upset because now you have to go four spaces instead of three spaces and you have to move the exact amount. So it's a constantly changing puzzle and it definitely feels uh, different at different player counts. Uh, um, at two, you can plan a lot more. At uh, the uh, four players, obviously, it's a bit more chaotic, but I've enjoyed this one over the years at all of these different player counts. I just think that mechanic is is wonderful. I, I, I like the idea, and I've seen it in other games, like uh, Emerald is a game that used that mechanic, but I've never seen a game that used it on both sides, where the, the number of spaces you move is equal to where you started, and then you get something based off of what is on the other end. So this is a game that I still have in my collection. I don't really see ever getting rid of it. Um, it usually plays in an hour, if not a little bit less, and it's the kind of game where I could go a few years without playing it, and then pull it off the shelf, and spend about one minute just skimming through the rules and be like, okay, yeah, I remember how to play this game. Let's play it now. Uh, and yeah, I just highly recommend it. I think it's an excellent game that came out a long time ago. And I do remember uh, it, it, seeing it played a decent amount right when I first started going to uh, uh, meet up uh, game nights. You know, it, it was coming out right then in 2009. And, you know, that's when I really started going to these meetups a lot. Next up, we have game number nine, and this one is Settlers of Catan. Uh, I guess technically it's called Catan now, but I know it as Settlers of Catan because this was my uh, gateway game. This is the game that really brought me into modern board gaming. Now, technically, it was uh, first published in, I think, uh, 95, and this is a game that I was first taught at the start of 2008. Um, long story short, I met some people at a random house party, and they mentioned they played Settlers of Catan weekly, and I had heard the name before, but I didn't know anything else about it. It, and I hadn't played board games in <laughs> decades at that point. Uh, and I started playing with them weekly. They invited me over there, which was very nice of them. It worked out well for them. One of those guys ended up marrying my sister. And <laughs> it's definitely a happily ever after kind of situation because, um, you know, we're all happy and I love board games now. So we played Settlers of Catan weekly for essentially that whole year. Uh, and I just fell head over heels with it. So this is a game that I played more than almost any other board game. But this is before I even knew, knew that BoardGameGeek.com existed, so I certainly wasn't logging my plays, so I don't actually know exactly how many games of this I've played. Uh, now, this is so far down the list because it still is in the top 10 or 11, I suppose, but there are many other games I prefer more, but, you know, that nostalgic feeling and the fact that I've played this one tens and tens of times with the same exact set of people, um, I, I have to acknowledge the great situation that that made. We had, you know, uh, legacy type uh, uh, rivalries that would uh, go for weeks. And, you know, remember when you did that thing to me three weeks ago? Well, this is payback. And we really got to know each other and how we different how we traded. And I guess I should talk about the game briefly. Um, this is a trading game. You have a hex board out in front of you and you're putting down roads and uh, cities and houses and uh, two dice are rolled on every player's turn. And then the different hexes will give resources to people based off of where their houses and their cities are. So that means you might get stuff when it's not your turn. In fact, you are uh, somewhat likely to. And the heart of this game is not only where do you place to play the odds, but also how you trade these cards. If you have resources you don't need, you try to trade those with other people. And so I love that trading mechanic. And we just had so much fun, uh, you know, lots of highs and lows with, you know, trades gone bad and uh, various uh, special cards that can mess with things. Uh, but it was just such an intense, engaging experience. And it just catapulted me into modern board gaming. Um, because of Catan, I remember I, I searched for it online once to see how much it would be to buy my own copy, and that's how I found Board Game Geek, and that's how I discovered that there were expansions to Settlers of Catan. I actually ended up buying the Cities and Nights expansion and gifted it to my friend, not for a birthday or anything. I just wanted to play it so badly, and he owned the base game, and then we played Cities and Nights like tens of times as well. I thought about giving that a separate entry right over here, but I also love the Cities and Nights expansion. That's my favorite way to play Settlers of Catan, at least with people who are okay with the extra complexity. So um, this this game, I think, stands up. I, honestly, I haven't played this one many years, but it has been creeping up my list of games that I want to play again soon because it's just been so long. And I think the nostalgia will be there and I fully expect it to still be a great experience as long as, you know, I'm playing with people who are okay with a bit of dice luck variance in the game. Uh, all right, let's now move on to an older game, which is number eight, and that is Bug House Chess. Now, 
I thought about not putting this one on the list, but I've had so much fun with this game that I felt like it should count. Uh, now, according to Board Game Geek, this has a publication date of 1960, although I'm not sure if it has ever actually been published. This is uh, more technically a chess variant. Now, I'm going to assume that you know how chess is played, or at least at a very high level. And what Bug House is, is it's a two versus two team-based uh, speed chess variant, where you play two games side to side, the person next to you is your partner, and you play different colors. So if I'm playing the black color, then my partner is playing white. And the same with the other team on the other side of the table. Now, the way I've always played it is we have a five minute chess clock and it is a game where you're trying to have um, one checkmate on either of the boards. But the catch is that whenever I take a piece from the board from my opponent, uh, obviously if I'm playing black, then my opponent is playing white. I take their white um, bishop, for instance. Instead of putting it off to the side, I give it to my partner who can then on their turn just slap it down anywhere on the board. So suddenly they have three bishops and my opponent only has one, and this leads itself to ridiculous situations. It's also a really interesting leveler of play skill because it's so wacky, and when I've played this one before, I've played with people who are very good with chess. I am not good at chess, and we would generally decide of the four of us who are the best two people. It would be on two different teams, and then we would try to, you know, balance out the other two people, and what it means is it's this frantic game of uh, chaos, as you can have multiple queens on a board and, you know, like <laughs> four rooks on one board. And also you have this amazing team dynamic where since it's kind of a speed chess type of game, I could be sitting here playing and my partner suddenly just yells at me that I just need to give them a rook. Uh, they don't care what I have to sacrifice. They, they, they scream at me. I could get rid of my queen. It doesn't matter. So I just do the best I can to give them a rook, even if it's an awful play for me. I give them the rook and then boom, they might just checkmate on their next turn uh, right there. So it has these really wacky situations where at a certain point when one player is doing better, the other person kind of becomes a, a resource a machine, just gifting things over while desperately trying not to be mated themselves. And oh my gosh, I've had so much fun playing Bug House Chess. It's essentially the only type of chess I'm interested in playing. Um, I'm not actually that interested in the base game of chess. I played it a bunch when I was a kid. My mom taught it to me and I have a lot of fond memories of playing with my mom, but um, this is the way that I enjoy it because I enjoy the team best based aspect. I like how it kind of balances things out. I like the chaos. I like the yelling. <laughs> it's just a really fun experience uh, that I hope to be able to play more in the future, although it has been quite some time. Uh, this one was played a lot on camping trips, for example. It definitely worked out well in, in a camping setting. Uh, all right, let's now move on to another really old game. Uh, this one's Liar's Dice, and much like Bug House Chess, this one I don't think has a specific hard date. Uh, so this one on Board Game Geek says it was published in 1800, which sounds pretty uh, rough. And effectively, Liar's Dice is just a dice game with a bunch of D6s. Um, for all I know, it could be twice as old as that or even three times as old. Uh, and the, the heart of this game is players are going to have a certain number of dice. Every time I played, we usually have five dice and you roll them and you kind of hide them under a cup or maybe behind your hand. And then it's a bluffing game where the person who is starting the round is going to say a number and a, a value and a number of dice. They might say, I think there are three value two dice. And that means they are saying that amongst all of the dice on the table, if let's say there's four of us, so we all have five dice, that means there are 20 dice total. We just rolled all of them. They can only see their five dice, so they see a quarter of the dice, and they say that there are three number twos. So now I'm next, and I have to increase one of those two numbers. I could say there are actually four number twos, or I could say there are three uh, number fives, for example. Now, you could just say the things that you see in front of you, but that's not fun. And at a certain point, you're obviously going to have to um, escalate beyond what you see in front of you. And if you don't bid higher, then instead you call the bluff and you essentially um, hold up your cup or your hands, and then everybody pulls their hands back and you count up the number. And if you are right, if if they said there's, you know, five number sixes and there's only four number sixes, then that person loses a die to the middle of the table and then we keep going. Um, but if they said there's five number sixes and there are at least five number sixes, then I lose a die because I am the one who called their bluff. And then we roll dice and go again. So what it means is there is certainly a fall behind loser syndrome to this game because as you do worse, you have less and less information in front of you and you keep playing until one person person is left. So there's player elimination, there's fall behind loser. Why would I rank this game so high? Well, because it is just an extreme amount of fun. <laughs> I've had so much fun with this game. Uh, this one was also taught to me by the people who taught me Settlers of Catan. So I have a nostalgic feeling there as well. Like we'd oftentimes play uh, uh, Liar's Dice after a game of Settlers of Catan at our weekly Catan nights. And the amount of 
fun and laughter and and uh, screams and yells that can happen in this game just catapults it up to such high levels of enjoyment. Uh, you know that uh, that moment where you you make a bluff and then the person to your left decides to bluff even higher and you just breathe out a sigh of relief because you knew you were just right on the limit. Um, those are just great moments and you reveal in you know ridiculous situations like how are there seven ones? There's only seven uh, fourteen dice or you know something like that. It's just really fun to experience. And yes, there is player elimination, but by the time players start getting eliminated, usually the game is uh, quickly accelerating towards the end, and this is definitely not a game that you can overanalyze, so it tends to go quickly. Uh, it also pairs well with uh, light drinking, <laughs> I've found. You know, having a beer or two uh, loosens up the bidding a little bit and can be uh, extremely fun. It also lends itself towards some great variants. Uh, for example, the way that I was taught, which I don't know if is uh, universal or not, was that ones by uh, their natural state are actually wild. Uh, but if the first person to call a bid says they're is a certain number of ones, then they are no longer wild for that round. So the first person has a bit of control if they want ones to be wild, and obviously having ones be wild can increase the variance even more. And then you have to think, like, is this a wild round or is this not a wild round? And, oh man, just so many wonderful things to think of. And I'm sure there's a thousand other slight variants that make this game great as well. So Liar's Dice is great. It's the reason why I will always have a big bag of D6s somewhere around the house so I could play it at some point. It hasn't been played in a long time, I will admit. And there are many kind of more modern versions of this game. I know Skull is very similar to Liar's Dice, but it plays a little quicker and honestly has some things in it that I don't love so much. I definitely prefer Liar's Dice in the uh, pure form, as long as you are okay with the caveats of player elimination and fall behind loser. But, you know, this is not a game that you take too seriously, and it's a game that I have had an extreme amount of fun of playing over the years. Uh, all right, let's now move on to game number six, and this is Six Nymphed. Uh, now, this one was published in 1994, and I believe it means six takes in German. Don't quote me on that, though. Uh, now, this is a really great game that was taught to me uh, right back in about 2009 when I first started um, uh, falling into modern board gaming in a big way, because this is a simultaneous action game that plays up to 10 people. Um, now, the way it works is you have this deck of 104 cards, and every card has a number going from 1 to 104. Now, you're going to put four of these out randomly in the middle of the table, and then you're going to deal out 10 cards to each of the other players, and then you go through 10 rounds of everyone simultaneously simultaneously choosing one card, and then flipping it over and seeing what happened with those numbers. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but what happens is you actually sort these numbers after they have been revealed into various rows associated with the cards in the middle based off of if you go above or below that number. Uh, so if there is a row where the rightmost card is a 45 and I played a 47, then it will likely get sorted right alongside that. And there's more to it, but I don't want to go into the details. But it is a type of game where you are definitely trying to get into the heads of your opponents, trying to figure out what card to put down, because if you are the person that puts the sixth card down in a row, then you take the row or all the cards that were there already and the card you just placed stays out there to start out a new row. So that's why it's called Six Takes. And this is a game where you do not want points. Um, the cards on uh, have various points on them and they can vary by a big amount. Some have one, some have like five or six. And at the end of each round, once everyone's played their 10 cards, you count up the points. And then as long as no one has more than 66 points, I think, then you play another round. And once anyone hits 66 points, the game is over and whoever has the lowest amount of points wins. The reason I like this game so much is because it is very easy to teach. I know I've skimmed over the rules a little bit, but if we were actually playing it, it'd be much easier to show with in a quick example. And I have played this one with so many different groups of people and it just always works. <laughs> it's just that moment of revealing and the uh, the worry about what is somebody else going to have. And like You're like, okay, this 47 is fine as long as no one else plays a 46. If someone plays a 46, then I am toast. And then you flip over and you're so happy that no one did or someone happened to have the 46 in that exact moment. And then obviously that's awful for you. And you're just trying to play these odds. And you're taking risks and you're doing the best you can. And obviously by the, the 10th round of, or 10th play of each round, Everyone just throws a card out and you just see what happens at the end of the round. And uh, this is a game that I was able to successfully play with my family just a couple of months ago. We had a social uh, distanced RV camping trip <laughs> outside and uh, I played this one with uh, my sister, brother-in-law, as well as uh, my mom. Um, brother-in-law, he's the one who actually taught me uh, Catan, so he definitely understands modern board gaming. And my sister has played a bunch as well. But my mom, she always wants to play board games with us because she wants to do stuff with us, but she certainly cannot handle high complexity. We taught her Catan once, and um, she did okay, but it was the maximum amount of complexity that she could handle. So Six Nymphed 
worked actually really great. The first round was a little clunky when people were trying to figure out how these cards worked, but once we made it through even one or two card plays, everyone got it, and we were laughing and just having such a great time. Um, I, I, I mean, you probably being able to tell that a big part of games that I enjoy, especially a lot of the games I'm talking about here, are uh, games that can evoke great situations where people are laughing, um, cries of various emotion, whether that be despair or joy uh, at a die roll or a card flip or something like that. And if you have control of that, then then that's even better. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think Six Nipped is wonderful. Also, the fact that it plays up to 10 players, great. <laughs> I mean, once you get past the sixth player, it gets really chaotic because at any point, any row can go. In fact, maybe the fifth row. But either way, the higher the player count, the more chaos it is. But also, the more chaos it is, the more fun it can be overall as well. So this is just a really excellent small box card game that came out a long time ago that we own a copy of, and I don't see us ever getting rid of it. Let's now move on to game number five, and that one is Coloretto. Now, this one came out in 2003, and it's designed by Michael Schott. And I played this one for the first time probably in, like, 2011, 2012, or something like that. Uh, now, this one very quickly became one of my favorite games, especially one of my favorite light games. Uh, now, this is a card game. It comes in a small box. It's, you know, probably less cards than uh, Six Nymphed, if not a little bit similar. And in this game, you just have uh, a series of cards that have different colored... Uh, uh, chameleons on them, and then a few cards that are slightly different with a couple of other icons. Uh, now, the mechanics of this game are you are going to be essentially doing set collection, trying to get points, and the way you do that is when it's your turn, you have to decide if you want to take a stack of cards that's face up in the middle of the table, or if you don't want to take a stack of cards, then a new card is drawn and placed out onto a stack to make that stack better for somebody else. So the key decision of this game is when do you take? Like, if you don't take because you want things to be a little bit better, then possibly that gets too good and somebody takes it away from you. By the time it's your turn, the options are even worse. Now, what you're trying to do is um, take these different colored geckos and put them in front of you where you will get uh, a varying number of victory points if you get more and more of them. But then there is this wonderful key rule where if you have too many sets of geckos, or I guess chameleons, you actually start to lose points for those instead. So you only want to score a few of these different types of uh, uh, chameleon sets, um, and if you take too many, that's a problem. So what that means is, when you decide you're not gonna take a card, you draw a new one, you decide what pile to put it down into, and you could try to make poison pill piles. Like, this pile is looking great for that opponent over there, but this is an awful card. It's gonna be worth negative points to them, but it's good for me, so I'm gonna put it on there and hope that that will still be there by the time it comes back around to me, but maybe it's not so bad for that person over there, and they take it, and it's a really simple game. Um, this is another one that I have actually kept in my uh, work backpack back when I used to do events for like a decade. Um, I would keep this in my work backpack because it was so small, and I played this one many times with coworkers when we were on break. Um, I did events, so, you know, we'd set up the show and then come back three hours later to take it down. Instead of all driving home and then driving back, we'd just, you know, go get dinner somewhere, and uh, I would bust this one out and play it with people. And uh, most of the people I played it with, uh, my, my coworkers, are not really board gamers or card gamers, but I would always tell them, um, I know this looks like a weird game with colorful gecko, uh, chameleons, keep calling them geckos, but I guarantee that within 10 minutes, you'll be yelling at each other, which is a selling point for my coworkers. <laughs> and uh, every time I said that without fail, that was the case because this game is so simple, so light and so mean, but it's also so quick that even though it could be quite mean and have awful moments where somebody puts that poison pill card down and you're so upset or somebody takes a pile you didn't expect and you're just so upset, well, the game itself takes like, I think, 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes. And uh, almost every time I play this one, we end up playing it again, maybe even three times in a row. And, you know, the, the bad moments are equally weighed out by the great moments. And honestly, there should be a good term for good, bad moments. Like those moments where somebody takes a pile away from you that you wanted or puts an awful card down. Like I'm still having fun in those moments. Like I wish it wasn't the case, but I'm probably swearing with a smile on my face, if that makes sense. There's got to be a good word for that, but um, I really enjoy those kind of situations again, and this game definitely brings that out, and I think that this game is just such a, a classic and elegant overall game that it's one I'm not getting rid of. I actually uh, went out and purchased a German version of the anniversary version of the game because I thought it looked nicer because this is a game that I wanted to have the prettiest, nicest version of because this is one that I don't see going anywhere. I, I don't play it all that often, but as far as a uh, filler game, this is one of my favorite, uh, and it's excellent. It's definitely stood the test of time.
Uh, next up, we have number four, which is Quirkle, and this one was first published in 2006. Now, this game is a bit of a slow burn for me. Uh, I was first taught this one probably in 2009 or 2010, and it is a tile lane game that feels uh, like you have taken out the vocabulary from Scrabble. Uh, in this game, there are uh, tiles, and every tile has a color and a shape, and um, it's going to be a different combination of them, and there are six colors and six shapes. So what you're doing is you're placing these tiles out on your turn, trying to make patterns, which I'll just call words for the moment, but they're like pattern words. And each word in this game is a set of the same color but different uh, shapes, or the same shapes but all different colors. So what that means is you're trying to put these out and they're going to score uh, adjacencies. Like, you know, if you put them down over here, you'll score for every other one that was orthogonally adjacent. I'm not going to talk about the details of scoring, but it feels like a very abstracted version of Scrabble scoring in a lot of ways. Uh, and again, the only vocabulary of this game is all the same color but different shape or all the same shape but different color. So you don't have to worry about, you know, side words and all that kind of stuff. Now, the first time or two that I played Corkle, I thought it was... Okay, it didn't really do anything for me, if I'm being honest. I thought it was just kind of, you know, a game, whatever. Uh, but then, um, I think a, a few years later, I ended up uh, playing this one a lot because an iOS version of it came out, and I played it with my then girlfriend, <laughs> now my wife, uh, and uh, she liked it so much that we we started playing it on iOS. And actually, um, I could play it on my phone, like on my iPhone, while she was playing it on her iPad at home. It could be played asynchronously. And, you know, my old job was doing events. And so a lot of times I would just be there babysitting an event, essentially doing nothing for five hours straight. And I'd want to be doing nothing. I'm only there in case something bad happened and I can run over there and fix the thing. Um, so hypothetically, you want to be bored in those situations. You don't want to be busy because that means things are going bad. But I would get so bored that um, Jessica would be at home on her iPad and I'd be at work, you know, somewhere 60 miles away. And we would play game after game after game of this on the iOS uh, version. It's an excellent two-player game because uh, you know that there are exactly three of each tile, shape, and color combination in the bag, and you are just constantly working off each other, trying to make sure you don't set up good options for your opponent while also setting yourself up really good things. Also, if you complete a word, which is going to be all six of the same color but different shape, or all six of the same shape but different color, you get six bonus points, which is significant in the game, and you keep playing until all the tiles are out of the bag. So this is a game that I have now played tens of times. Almost all of them have actually been uh, on uh, the iOS app, actually, and I think it's just so much fun. It's it's such a wonderfully tactical but also strategic game as you're trying to set things up. Like, it's a great balance of those two things. It's a really simple game to teach as well. Uh, we actually um, taught this one to uh, my wife's uh, uh, parents, and we, we they loved it so much that they went home and they bought their own copy, and then they played it every single day to the point where they could not play their copy anymore because they couldn't tell the difference between the different colors and the different shapes because the actual, the, the, the printing had scuffed off. So they bought a new copy and they are now well on their way to that new copy not being playable either. So we taught it to them. We played it like twice, I think, and they have now played it literally hundreds of times. They play it every single day. They used to play dominoes and that's why we taught them Quirkle because they play dominoes every day and we figured this is similar-ish to dominoes. And I think that's definitely a testament to not only that this is an excellent two-player game, they they play a two-player, I think, essentially exclusively, but it's also a lot of fun with three and four players as well. Uh, so yeah, this is an excellent game. Uh, I think it uh, definitely is worth being high up on the list. Uh, part of me feels like it maybe should have been higher, but I like the games up on the list even more, even though I've had so much fun with Quirkle. Uh, so speaking of other games, let's now move on to number three, which is Carcassonne. Now, this one came out in 2000, and I, I was not originally super into this game. Like, the first time I played it, I thought it was fine. This is a tile lane game. Actually, this sounds kind of similar to Quirkle now that I think about it. Um, Carcassonne is a tile lane game where you draw a single tile, and then you place it out into a communal area, um, much like Quirkle, interestingly enough, and then you have the option to place a meeple down on top of it uh, in various different spots to score, whether it's in a city or on a road or as a farmer, and you keep playing until every single one of the tiles is uh, drawn, and then you score up some final scores, and whoever has the most points wins. Now, this game, wow, I hadn't thought about the parallels, but the reason I fell in love with this game was also because of an iOS app. Uh, there was an excellent app for this one. I don't think it's out anymore. I think there's a new one, which is probably fine. I haven't tried, but there was an excellent iOS app for this game out uh, around 2011, 2012, and I ended up actually playing 
probably tens of games with this uh, of this with uh, various of my friends who also had it. Um, Jessica wasn't a huge fan of this one. Actually, now that I think about it, we weren't dating yet, so Jessica wasn't in the picture at that point. Um, but um, I played so many two-player games of uh, Carcassonne with opponents, and this is an amazing two-player experience. Like, Quirkle is a very good two-player experience. It's got some, you know, like I said, uh, some strategy and some tactics, definitely some things to think about. But Carcassonne is an incredible strategy game that also has a tactical element of you just drawing a single tile and having to put it somewhere. But there are so many things that you build up, you layer, you, you essentially um, make assaults on your opponent's um, castles sometimes effectively without actually doing that. It doesn't look like that, but it, that's the way it feels. There's just so many ways to, like, make a scoring area awful for your opponent or try to break out and do something over here. And you're obviously playing the odds because you don't know what the next tile you're uh, going to draw is, but you're trying to set yourself up to have lots of good opportunities while also almost staking claim with your farmers, which I'm not going to talk about the details of all of these mechanics, but it's just a really tight two-player game. And I've also played it many times at three and four uh, in real life, and I think it's excellent at those player counts as well. But much like Quirkle, I fell head over heels with this one uh, at two players, specifically playing it online. Uh, and um, playing it in person, I think, is also exceptional. Just playing online was easier. We'd, you know, play it asynchronously at work, and I'd, you know, take like maybe two days to play a full game as we, you know, do a couple moves on different breaks with some of my friends. And uh, I just think that the simplicity of this game the fact that it's a relatively small box overall, and it's just a, you know, a little stack of tiles about yay high. Um, there's about a million expansions for this game, but I'm a fan of just playing the basic game only. Um, I, I think that just makes it such an incredible experience. Uh, I first uh, heard about Carcassonne back when uh, I was really into Catan, because I remember one of the people in our Catan group did own a copy of Carcassonne, and he brought it to a camping trip once. And I remember kind of uh, looking at the back of the box and trying to read the rules and thinking it seemed incredibly confusing. <laughs> this is like, must have been 2008. And I just remember looking through the rules, and I was like, I have no idea how this game works. And, you know, Things have definitely changed over time, uh, but uh, I'm very glad I ended up coming around to Carcassonne. It's one that I uh, bought a copy of about two years ago at a flea market. I got it for, I think, $10 or something like that, and I don't expect to ever remove this one from my collection. Uh, you know, it usually takes, for a two-player game, about maybe 45 minutes, and if you play a four-player game, maybe a little bit over an hour. Uh, it's just an amazing experience. It's so easy to teach, and it feels so impactful. Like, every play that you do, every tile that you place can be so impactful impactful to the overall gameplay that I just think um, this one deserves to be a classic, and it's one that I don't see myself getting rid of. So let's now move on to game number two, which is Crokinole. Now, this is one of the oldest games on this list. Board Game Geek has it listed as a published date of 1876, but I'm not super confident that's accurate. Uh, it's my understanding that this is a traditional dexterity-style game that was developed in Canada somewhere at some point in the 1800s. Now, this is a two- or four-player game, and I'll talk about it as a two-player game at first. Now, in this game, you have a stack of these uh, uh, discs that are in your color, and your opponent has a stack of theirs. Um, going off my memory, I think it's six or maybe eight discs. It's actually been a little bit since I played this one, but uh, on your turn, you're going to flick this disc out onto the circular board, and there is a universal rule in this game where if your opponent has any of their discs on the board, then the only way my flick is going to be legal is if by flicking my disc, one of my opponents will have their tokens be um, touched by one of my, uh, my discs. So what that means is, if I flick my new disc and it hits an opponent's disc, that's fine, that's legal. It also means if I flick my disc to hit another one of my discs to hit an opponent's disc, then that's also legal. But if I flick my disc and none of my opponent's pieces are touched by any of my pieces, then my shot is invalid, I remove it from the board, and I actually remove all of my other pieces that I hit on my turn, if it was an illegal shot. Now, if there are no opponent's pieces on the board, then a shot is legal if you flick it and the disc ends somewhere in the middle area of the board. And the last real rule to the game is you're going to keep playing until everyone has flicked all of their discs, and then you count up the score for each player, and the discs in the outer area are worth 5 points, the next area is worth 10, after that the center area is 15, and any discs that make it into the middle, middle, middle spot are removed immediately and worth 20 points at the end of the game. And each person counts up their score, and then the difference in the scores is the actual points that are made. So if I score 35 points and my opponent scores 30, then I actually get 5 points, 
I log those and you play until you get to 100 points. Um, now, the idea, the, the, the fact that you have to interact with your opponent's pieces and that there's a risk to flicking into your own pieces to then hit your opponent's pieces makes for some amazing moments. Uh, this is an incredible game. Like, it doesn't sound like much. It really probably doesn't. It wouldn't surprise me if you're sitting here saying, really, this is number two? But the experience of trying to make all this work, of planning it out and then doing the flick and then seeing how you did is just exceptional. Maybe it was perfect. It glided right through between these two pegs and smacked that other thing off the board and it was amazing. Or maybe it somehow careens over here, knocks three of your other discs, but hits none of your opponents, clears all your stuff from the board, and it was just a catastrophe. Uh, or, of course, you have the awful moments where you flick your disc, it hits your opponent, and it hits their disc into the middle, scoring them 20 points, which is awful as well. Uh, so this game breeds some amazing moments, like really high highs as well as lows. Again, this has those good bad moments where if you flick and you hit, you clear like three of your pieces off and hit none of your opponents, that's obviously bad. But again, you're usually groaning and swearing with a smile on your face, or at least I am usually when I'm playing this game. Now, this game is actually best, in my opinion, at four players where it's two versus two. Now, in this setting, you are partnered up with a person across the table from you, and then your opposing teams are right next to you, and you go in order around the table, and the number of discs are split in half. Now, the reason I like this so much is because this puts out even more opportunities for you to uh, hit your opponent's pieces, like there's going to be um, different scattered areas of where the tokens are going to be, but also... I really like team-based situations where you can like talk through things. And also if you have those high highs, then you are sharing that with somebody that you hypothetically like, you're playing games with them. And if you have those awful moments, well, it's not just you, it's, you know, kind of you as a team. Although I guess if you do an awful shot and it's awful for your team, maybe your partner won't be super happy with you. But again, I only play with people who are going to laugh off issues like that. Like we definitely don't take uh, Crokinole too seriously. Now this game is so much fun, actually. That I played it uh, at a, a game night, I think at some point in 2009 or something. Somebody brought this big crokinole board to a, a game store and we played it. And I was so impressed that I ended up buying uh, a uh, the first version of the, I believe it was the Eagle Griffin crokinole board that, was, that came out probably around then, maybe 2010, 2011. It was, I believe, a Kickstarter, one of the first Kickstarters. So I got that board. I think it cost about $100, and I played with that one a bunch, and I realized that I like Crokinole so much that I wanted to invest in an art piece version of this game. Uh, it's it's a cool-looking game. It's, it's a nice, pretty board, and obviously you usually, like, hang it on the wall. And there are these guys, they're called the Holinsky Brothers, who, at least back then, I'm not sure if they still do, but back then they would make... Uh, hand make crokinole boards, each one kind of one of a kind. And so I decided to order one of those. And it has this, uh, at least it did back in like 2012, this crazy process where when you order them, you just tell them what you want. Like I want this kind of, like I want a model texture in the middle and I want light color over here. And you know, you can ask for all these custom things and they say, sure. And they make it you haven't paid them anything and they just put it in the list. So I, I asked for a specific type of board uh, and like four months later, I got an email back and they said, we made your board and here's a photo of it. And I did not like it. It, it didn't actually look that good. It's what I asked for, but it didn't actually look that great. And the way it worked with them is I said, actually, I'm not interested in that. I would actually like a board that actually looks like this instead of that. And they said, that's fine because every time someone declines a board that was made custom for them, they just put it up onto their marketplace and it would sell within a day to somebody. So I put it in another order and like three months later, I got another email with a new custom board they made for me, a second one. And I said, yes, that one's great. And I paid for it and I got it and I still have it to this day. It's on my wall in my game room. It's been a while since I played it. Honestly, sometimes I kind of forget it's there because I'm so used to seeing it on the wall and it's beautiful, but it's one I, I never see getting rid of. It's just a really wonderful game. It's a wonderful art piece. It's just a cool thing to have as a collector's item. And uh, yeah, I foresee myself playing this one more in the future. Just talking about it right now makes me realize that, um, yeah, I like to get this one played again at some point. And certainly once uh, game nights start back again, maybe I'll like take it off the wall and put it in the middle of the table and be like, let's play Crokinole before we play something else, just because it is such an exceptional time. All right, we have now reached game number one, which came out in 1991, and that one is Teach You. Now, this is the game that I have uh, the most logged plays of. Uh, I started logging my plays on BoardGameGeek in 2010, January of 2010, and actually Crokinole has the second most logged plays. I've, I've like something like 80 or so logged plays of Crokinole, but for Teach You, I have about 100 logged plays, and the thing about Teach You is that 
when I started logging them in January of 2010, I had already likely played Tichu well over 100 times. Uh, the reason for that is because of the board game group I got into that first really um, uh, <laughs> shoved me down the rabbit hole of board gaming uh, played Tichu essentially every single game night. Um, they had game nights on every Tuesday and every Thursday night uh, in the Berkeley area. And I, I lived an hour away and I would drive an hour each way twice a week for essentially, you know, <laughs> at least one year before I moved down closer uh, to play games here. And I would, um, you know, play a couple of games, but by the end of every single game night, everyone was playing Tichu. And by everyone, I mean like 20 to 30 people. It was just like, people would call it Tichu o'clock. Like, oh, it's about, you know, nine o'clock or 9.30. It's starting to be Tichu o'clock as, you know, other games wrap up and people just invariably start playing Tichu. And by the time it's 11 o'clock, there's like seven or eight games of Tichu happening at any given uh, uh, game night, again, twice a week. And I did this for, you know, well over a year or two before I even started actually logging these plays. Um, so likely I've, I've played uh, two to 300 games of Tichu. And I think that alone is going to probably be enough to put it at the top of the list. Like I would not keep playing this game if I didn't love it so much. And this is a card climbing style game. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it's a standard 52 card deck plus four special kind of um, joker uh, cards that have their own uh, specific rules. And it's a partnership-based game. Uh, I've actually talked about a couple partnership games today. It seems like I do like those a lot. Uh, Teach You is partnership. I think Coconut is best at partnership. And Bug House Chess is also a partnership style game. Uh, now, in Teach You, you are trying to just get rid of your cards in your hand. And you can do that by putting out, like, singles or doubles or a full house. I'm not going to talk about the details of it. But if somebody puts out a type of pattern, then everyone else has to match that or beat it. and uh, Or, I guess, has to beat it. <laughs> Matching it isn't going to help. And um, at the end of the... Uh, uh, the, each phase after everyone passes, then whoever did the last put the last cards down takes those cards and they get to play again. Now, the reason I love this game, I'm, again, I'm skimming over all the details, but the reason this game is amazing is because of the idea of the teach you call. Uh, it's called teach you, and uh, before you play your first card in any, any given hand, you can call teach you, and you simply do that by saying teach you. <laughs> and that is a 100 point bet that you specifically will get rid of all of your cards before anyone else, including your partner who is across the table. Now, again, you have to make this bet before you play anything. And if anyone else gets rid of all their cards before you do, then you as a team collectively lose 100 points. And this is a game you play to 1000 points overall. There are other ways to get points that I won't go into the specifics of. But um, the teach you call is really why this game is amazing. Because it makes such incredible depths of knowledge and strategy and experience looking at a hand and figuring out, is this a hand that's worth calling to you? Is this the best hand out of all of the cards? Uh, you know, every card is dealt out in every single round. So is this the best set of, I think, 14 cards, 15 cards? Don't check my math. <laughs> uh, 14 cards, I think, um, uh, amongst everyone else. And if your partner calls teach you, then you have this really amazing situation where you're not allowed to really communicate at all with what you have, but you are now not trying to get rid of your cards. You're trying to play your cards in such a way to uh, hamper your opponents from messing with your partner to try and aid them in getting out as quickly as possible, hypothetically first before everyone else. Um, now, on top of that, you can play, um, well, when you play the standard rules, which is what we did, you can play with a grand teach you, where once you see half of your cards, you can make a 200 point bet, and then you pull up the other half of your cards and you see if you've made an awful mistake. And this is usually done when, as a Hail Mary when one team is falling behind. And this, an interesting thing about this game to me is the fact that it's not quick. Like, Crokinole is a quick game. Like a full game of that usually takes between 10 and 20 minutes, depending on how it goes. Uh, Quirkle, it may be like a 40 minute game. Uh, Colorado, Six Nymph, these are very quick games. Tichu can really range. Like I've had the uh, a single mythical three hand game, which took about 10 minutes, where uh, we won in three hands. We got a thousand points in three hands. But on average, a game of Tichu takes between 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, oftentimes, you know, closer to 90 minutes, sometimes even more, uh, especially if you're playing with equal caliber people because of teach you calls and then you lose points and you gain points and you're losing points all over the place. So the fact that I've played a game that can play up to two hours 300 plus times potentially is a humongous testament. And it's just an incredible amount of my life that I've spent playing this game and really delving into figuring out how to play it well and really enjoying it. Now, I've actually barely played it for the last five years or so. I think I have like two log plays in the five in the last five years. Um, I did play it at Gamma uh, this, this year, <laughs> right before COVID happened and everything. Uh, I taught it to a couple of people. I played it with uh, Eric Martin from Board Game Geek, who also loves Teach You. And it was one of the best gaming experiences of my entire year 
that happened right there in March at the beginning of the year, teaching it to two people and playing it uh, with Eric. And um, that just really solidified this. Like that play at Gamma was like, you know what? This really is essentially my favorite game. Uh, definitely, arguably my favorite game, certainly of older games, ones that were published uh, in 2010 or earlier, uh, because I just love it so much. I have so much experience with it. It's like a part of me as a gaming person. Like I can't even break that out anymore. It's just, it's there. I feel like I'm like branded by Teach You. And I, it wouldn't surprise me if I still love this game, you know, 30 or 40 years from now. And I hope I'll have opportunities to play it at that point in the future. Um, I could technically go on and on about Teach You and the amazing experiences that I've had with it. But uh, I think I should probably just wrap this up and say it's an incredible game. I know that it's, it's not... Um, totally unique. I know it's a kind of a, a mishmash of many other games like Deuces and, and whatnot, but what Teach You is, what, what it comes together as, is such an amazing experience. The only issue I have with it is that it's a rough teach. Uh, the ideal way to teach this game is have one or two people not know it, um, but you should never teach this game if only one person knows it. I've tried several times and it just does not work, which is heartbreaking for me considering I love this game so much. So it's, it's kind of a strange situation where you have to have a cultivated teaching experience to really pull people people in to the astonishing world that is playing Teach You. And yeah, I, I hope to play it uncountable number of times more in my life. Uh, it's not really getting played much these days because I do play, you know, new stuff for the most part, but Teach You is never going to be going away. Well, that has brought us to the end of this list. And I am sure there are many people who are uh, talking to their screen saying, how come he didn't talk about Dominion? How come he didn't talk about Pandemic or uh, Seven Wonders? Uh, I didn't, how he didn't talk about, I believe, Haunted Teutonica came out in 2010. I didn't talk about actually any games that came out in 2010. Uh, Raw is another excellent game that came out before 2010. And the reason is because I just like these 11 games more <laughs> overall. Uh, I know that Dominion was, you know, transformative on the board gaming industry. And I loved it when I first uh, was getting into the industry. It was like the first game I physically bought. Uh, but, you know, when looking back at the test of time, I like all the other ones better. And it's tough making these lists, making these decisions. It's entirely possible I could convince myself that many of these should be swapped around. But like I said, I made this a top 11 list because I, I didn't want to not talk about Can't Stop and I didn't want to take any of the other things out. So I guess that means I do stand by this list overall. And uh, yeah, let me know if you um, know of any uh, gems that I, I missed. And there are many games that came out before 2010 that I've just never actually had an opportunity to play. Uh, you know, El Grande is one of them and there are many others that I'm not going to try to uh, rattle off at this point. There's just, you know, so many games and uh, only a certain amount of time to play them. And uh, yeah, if, if I've missed like your absolute favorite game, then let me know a comment and um, maybe I'll consider that for the future when I'm trying to figure out what new games to play if I'm, you know, kind of sick of playing brand new stuff. But uh, either way, I hope that you have enjoyed this top 10 list and I think that's going to bring this one to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.